Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. Upstairs, a few of us gathered just before the show, and we fortified ourselves by reciting together the inspiring congressional motto that I'm now going to ask all of you to recite along with me. Because the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. That was so spiritually uplifting here on a Monday morning. And I really, the reason we recite it is, although we're a private institution, it's important to remember that it was created during this moment of bipartisanship to encourage Americans of different perspectives to converge around the values and document which unite us, which is the US Constitution, and that is so important at this polarized times. Ladies and gentlemen, there are just a bunch of really thrilling new initiatives at the Constitution Center. Just last week, we opened American Treasures, which is the first time in American history that the five rarest drafts of the US Constitution have appeared in one place, not even during the Constitutional Convention itself was James Madison's very first draft of the Constitution, the kind of sketch notes of the Committee of Detail, presented along with the first manuscript draft of Wilson's notes of the Committee of Detail report, presented right next to the uh, Committee of Style report. And they're all downstairs, and you can now find them online. This week, constitutioncenter.org backslash treasures, you and learners across America will be able to click on the text of each of these three documents, uh, each of the five documents, see how the first Wilson draft had no preamble. The second one did have a preamble that talked about we the people of the states of New Hampshire, California, there was no California, New Hampshire, <laughs> Providence, <laughs> Massachusetts, and so forth. I'm so enthusiastic. I'm looking west, as Jefferson always did, at Monticello to inspire himself. And then the, the third draft is we the people of the United States, signaling Wilson's belief that we the people of the United States as a whole are sovereign, not the people of the individual states or the king in parliament. So that's opening. Next week we open an amazing exhibit on John Marshall and his constitutional legacy, which includes not only the great Chief Justice's writing desk where he wrote his most important opinions, but also, I'm slightly uh, alarmed to uh, confess, his gallstones, which were, were at the Mutter Museum uh, down the street and will be reposed happily here at the National Constitution Center for all to enjoy. They were, were removed by Dr. Physic in an operation that almost killed the great chief, and happily he survived and his greatness persevered. And I'm really thrilled to announce that just recently the Pew uh, Charitable Trust gave us a very important grant which will provide the seed money for a new gallery on the constitutional legacy of the Civil War and Reconstruction. It's so exciting and important that we raise the rest of the money that will allow this to be open because we will display, along with rare artifacts from the Civil War Museum of Philadelphia and the, in partnership with the Gettysburg Foundation, like the flag that Lincoln flew over Independence Hall on the way to his first inaugural, along with rare copies of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which made the promise of the new birth of freedom of Gettysburg a reality, and we will tell the story of the constitutional progress of equality in America in a way that all Americans and students from 8 to 80 can appreciate, and I'm so excited about the possibility on the first floor of the Constitution Center to display the rarest first drafts of the Constitution at the founding era, and then the rarest amendments of the second founding of America during Reconstruction. It will be very exciting. All right, there's more to say, but I, we've got to start this show because um, it's so ex this is so exciting and important. This introduction is going to be very easy to make because it's so heartfelt. Uh, Floyd Abrams is a constitutional hero. He is America's greatest uh, First Amendment lawyer. I once said in an admiring book review that if I were a real lawyer, I would like to be Floyd Abrams. Uh, and Floyd Abrams is more than just a real lawyer. He is responsible for some of the most important Supreme Court victories for the First Amendment ever, beginning with the Pentagon Papers case. And he's now written this beautiful, concise, passionate, eloquent, and 
soulful book. I, I think I will use that word. He talks about the soul of the First Amendment, and this is a soulful book because with passion, he distills the essence of what the First Amendment means, and then he contrasts it to other countries across Europe and across the world, which have a very different understanding of free speech, and in the process of that contrast, he helps us embrace all the more fervently these principles which we think we all take for granted, but in fact, today are very much under siege. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the great constitutionalist, Floyd Abrams. Floyd, welcome back. It's such an honor to always have you at the Constitution Center. Congratulations on this magnificent book. And I want to start with the French election. So in France, there is a ban on discussing the election several days before it. Uh, how is that possible? What are the consequences? And why does our First Amendment forbid that? Then? Yeah, I mean, think of it. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, as you may have read, uh, a lot of the material and the files of the Macron side the, the Victorian side, were hacked and were made available publicly, presumably or likely, by Russian sources. Uh, and in France, it is illegal for the candidates or their campaigns to campaign at all in the last 45, 44 hours of the campaign. I mean, the campaign's over. The public is supposed to think about it. Uh, or talk to each other, but the campaigns aren't allowed to say anything. And the release of this hacked material was literally minutes before that period of silence to which both candidates duly observed uh, occurred. Uh, it is so uh, unthinkable here uh, that First of all, that it would have been adopted, but, but for our purposes now, that the First Amendment would allow a ban on speech by candidates for the presidency at a time when it may be most important. And, and with this example, I mean, if I were teaching a course, uh, I would have tried, I would hoped I would have made up uh, a, a, a hypothetical uh, in which something really important leaked during the period of campaign silence. And you can think of all the good reasons for the silence. You don't want last minute charges maybe back and forth. Uh, you want a period of contemplation. Uh, I'm sure there are other, other ways to phrase it. But what's telling to me is that no American lawyer could have lost that case <laughs> if, if that had gone to our Supreme Court uh, and one of the candidates had protested by going to court and quite possibly if the press had brought an action. Uh, it raises some other issues, but, but, it, but it, it wouldn't have been a close case. And the answer to why is why we have a First Amendment in the first place is that we mean to limit the government's role and the government's power uh, over speech, probably more than anything, political speech, but not just political speech. Uh, and the time when political speech is most telling is on the eve of an election. So it wouldn't have been a hard case here, but I've been struck just watching television about the election no one is saying, isn't it interesting that the French, you know, have this profoundly and, and seriously uh, uh, different approach to public discourse and to freedom of speech. And that in good part is what my book is about with lots of other examples, some of which perhaps you and I will talk about. Well, let's, because we've jumped right in, let's talk about the nearest analog, and that is Citizens United. It's the most controversial uh, example. But Floyd, um, with a heroic devotion to bipartisan principle, argued the Citizens United case and won it. You obviously took a Don't lot Don't leave, please. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> Almost. You took flack from your friends on the progressive uh, left and were praised by the right, although there were other civil libertarian liberals, like in Nadine Strossen, the 
former head of the ACLU who praised you. I found this uh, to be the most compelling popular defense of the majority in Citizens United that I've seen, but I do have some questions about it. Why don't you tell the audience why you believe that on constitutional grounds Citizens right. United was so obviously correctly decided? I made a sort of joke a minute ago about how if I were drafting uh, an exam for students, I might have picked the French example. If I were drafting an example of why a Citizens United type ruling should, should have occurred, it would have been the very facts of Citizens United, a rather smallish conservative group, partially but not even much, funded by corporate money, does a one hour blast at Hillary Clinton when she seemed to be the likely Democratic candidate for president in 2008. S Senator Obama, of course, was nominated, but at that time, Hillary Clinton would seem to be the leading candidate. And this organization interviewed a lot of people and came up with what I viewed as a, as a hit job, but in any event, a starkly unfriendly, critical view of the leading candidate of one of the two political parties for president. Uh, and the whole thing was, as Justice Kennedy said in his opinion, uh, a, an articulation of why she should not be president. Now, it would have been a crime for that to be shown under the law as it then existed within 60 days of an election on television or 30 days of a primary on television or cable or satellite because that is what the McCain-Feingold law provided. And it provided it because there was some, it, it happens, not much, but that's happenstance, some corporate money uh, which was given to this organization. Now for me, that made it an easy case. I mean, for me, I asked myself, how could, how could that not be protected by the First Amendment? A, a political, politically oriented group with strong views on who ought to be elected prepares a documentary, however one may view the side it was on or even the fairness of it, a documentary about a candidate for president and it's a crime, a crime to put it on television at the time when it's most important that people focus on politics, on who should be nominated at that time and who should be elected. And the crime is simply because there was some corporate money involved in the entity that put it out. Well, for me, that was just uh, uh, unacceptable. And it was really that that, that led me to a, agree to represent Senator McConnell, uh, who was uh, a, a friend of the court and amicus curiae in the case, and to be one of the two lawyers who argued on, on behalf of Citizens United. So that was sort of my starting point. Uh, I had come, as my book uh, uh, sets forth, to change my view on this subject in good part because I was persuaded by an opinion of Justice Scalia in an earlier case uh, about this issue of campaign finance and money in politics uh, and the like. Uh, and it seemed to me and seems to me that all the dangers that the First Amendment are designed to prevent and protect against. Too much government power over speech, press, religion, assembly, too much government uh, risk, too much risk of government chilling speech and therefore preventing it, uh, led me to the conclusion that uh, I didn't think the government ought to have a role with respect to the money that people and in Citizens United, corporations spend uh, having their say, especially if it had to be publicly disclosed, as it is, uh, who or what is spending the money. So on all these super PACs that, that you read about and that should be written about, all, all these super PACs, we know to the dollar 
who's given money. And by the way, the overwhelming amount is by individuals, wealthy individuals to be sure, but individuals, not corporations. About 88% of the money donated to super PACs throughout 2016 was by, was by individuals. So as to them, Citizens United itself wouldn't have a real impact since it just dealt with corporations and unions. In any event, that's where I was, was and am uh, coming from uh, on, on this subject. And uh, you know, one, one of the reasons that I think that we haven't had what I consider a serious public debate about it is political, not ideological, not jurisprudential. Political in the sense that Democrats think or thought that it hurts them, and they've strongly opposed it, proposed constitutional amendments to deal with it. Uh, and the Republicans who think it helps them don't like to talk about it because there's nothing in it for them uh, to have a big public debate about Citizens United. So we've had a, a deeply one-sided discussion with, with occasional outsiders like me weighing in. But, but, in, but in terms of what the public has heard about the benefits or harm caused in this area, uh, it, uh, it's been very much uh, anti-Citizens United. Indeed, polling, this is one of the few things that brings the public together on a nonpartisan basis. <laughs> the latest polling data shows 80% of the public Republican, 80% of the public Democrats oppose Citizens United. So uh, on that, uh, even I need a First Amendment. Well, you do a very powerful job here of showing how your uh, support for the constitutional conclusion in Citizens United is consistent with your general opposition to any restrictions on political speech. Um, and you also note that the last election, where the winner spent less than the uh, loser, might call into question some of the political analysis. But I just want to ask one more constitutional question. What would Brandeis have thought of <laughs> Citizens United? Right. I asked Justice Ginsburg that for right. my Brandeis book, and Brandeis is a mutual hero right. of ours. And she told me Brandeis would not have been a fan of Citizens United, not at all, because he had a horror of corporate bigness. Yeah. And although he might have made an exception for this corporation in Citizens United that was basically a nonprofit, which got little corporate money, Exxon is different. And corporations were treated differently by Madison and Jefferson and Jackson and Brandeis all throughout American history. And 1907 treated corporations differently. So why should Exxon have the same free speech rights right. as you or me? Well, let me answer it in two ways. Uh, first, uh, the, the beginning uh, of your question. I agree that Justice Brandeis, uh, as of today and as of then, would not have supported Citizens United. On the other hand, I ask myself, who's the most recent Supreme Court justice who was the strongest proponent of free expression and free speech for his generation, the way Justice Brandeis was for his? And that was Justice Brennan. Justice Brennan joined the opinion in the case before Citizens United, a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, which dealt not with corporations, but with individuals. And in the strongest terms, said that uh, we could not, could not allow the government to have the power to limit speech by individuals uh, by limiting what the people could spend to get their speech out. Uh, and so, uh, look, on a, uh, one could say on a pragmatic basis, maybe Justice Brennan also would not have voted the way in Citizens United that he sure sounded as if he believed in Buckley versus Vallejo. And maybe he would have come to the Brandeisian position of, of such uh, uh, fear and, and uh, concern about the power of big corporations that he would have been there at the end of the day. What I'm saying is simply, if you take seriously what Justice Brennan said about the First Amendment, he would have been on 
our side uh, in the case. Now for Exxon uh, and the like, uh, it seems to me that the fairer way to say it is, uh, you know, why should any corporation uh, be able to participate in the political process? Again, assuming as I am, which is almost all accurate, uh, that's one exception I'm glad to talk about, but, but why should we let corporations speak too? Of course, we do that in areas in which we're very comfortable uh, with respect to enormous press corporations. Uh, there aren't so many anymore, but there was a time when there were only a few newspapers that were national in scope and more important in which newspapers were one, one town newspapers where people got all their news from one newspaper and that, that's living memory too. And the Supreme Court in cases involving that unanimously said, well, you know, we can't tell a newspaper what to print. We understand how powerful they are. We, we understand that people may get all their news from the local press and the local press may be just one newspaper. But uh, we just can't tell a newspaper what to say. The general rule in free speech is the same, whoever or whatever the speaker is. Uh, I think that to say that the New York Times can run an editorial uh, denouncing uh, 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 importation of foreign oil uh, from this place or that place, but that Exxon, which has an interest in that, can't, uh, is unacceptable. Uh, I don't think that the, we should read the Bill of Rights as so loading the dice on one side of issues of public importance and public uh, disagreement. Now again, I think it's really important that we know who's speaking, uh, but I think if we have that, uh, and we, we generally do, and, and again with these super PACs, we absolutely do, uh, that, that it is more dangerous to, to say that sort of entity, not, not just people, entity can't speak or can't speak much, uh, than it is to say the dangers of their speech is so great that we will either not permit them to speak or uh, in effect uh, limit uh, the amount of speech they may engage in. I mean, as a general proposition, we, we don't allow fine tuning of how much speech may be made by this person or that person or by this entity formed by people or that person. Uh, we can do a lot of things economically to corporations and to wealthy people too, uh, which have nothing to do with the First Amendment. If we're concerned about how big and powerful certain corporations are, we can do whatever Congress basically chooses to do, and it will likely be constitutional. If we think certain people or too many people, of too few and too many of them have too much power, because they have too much money, we can, we can deal with that. Uh, Congress is allowed to deal with that. The president is allowed to propose legislation. Where I get off that boat is when we say the way to deal with economic injustice or economic inequality is to limit speech rather than to limit the amount of money or the amount of economic power these organizations have. Wonderful. Uh, well, one of the many uh, <coughs> beautiful things about this book is you contrast the American tradition so vividly with that of Europe. And one very dramatic example you give is the French right to be forgotten, which comes from the droit à l'oubli, or the right of oblivion which is so French. It's all the French want to be forgotten, like Sartre, and the Americans want to be remembered. But as you describe it in this book, in Europe, if we were having this show and someone were tweeting, Jeff is asking boring questions, or Floyd is going on too long, then after the show, both of us it. could I demand get, that this scurrilous it. tweet be removed, and Google would have to decide if we're public figures and if the tweet is relevant or not. And if they guess wrong, then Google is liable for up to 2% of its annual income, which was $60 billion last year. 
So as a result of this right, as you describe it, Google has taken down nearly 500,000 truthful but embarrassing bits of content, and you list them in this amazing part of the book, and, and many seem, uh, here's, here, here are the, some of the stories, an article about a mother of two who was unanimously found not guilty of charges against, made by a 16-year-old male pupil who alleged they had a relationship, uh, an article about a company director who killed himself and on Skype. All of this would be absolutely protected in America, but it's not in Europe. Tell us why not yeah, and why America yeah. is right. Yeah. I, I mean, th this is a very interesting and quite recent development that, that just uh, oh, five or six years ago, uh, a European court de decided that uh, after a certain amount of time, the amount not, not necessarily fixed, but after enough time passes, when newspaper articles or the like are no longer considered relevant about people, and generally about people who are not ongoing political people, but not relevant anymore, the person can ask Google, as, as you said, take it down, I, I don't want that on Google. It, I mean, it may be in the newspaper's files, but, it, but Google can't carry it anymore. Uh, and. Uh, it is a privacy-protecting notion. Uh, why should someone suffer so much from something that happened so long ago? So a recent case in Belgium, for example, a, a, dr a driver of a, a car in a terrible accident. Uh, the driver was responsible, two people died, and an automobile crash. Not a public figure, a, a real person uh, and, a, and, a, and a responsible for a terrible event. Now, it was a, there were newspaper articles about it in Belgium, let's say a dozen years ago. So he says to Google, I don't want my name there anymore. And Google has to take it down, and did. Uh, Google indeed actually argued that it shouldn't have to, but it lost in court. So Google ha had to take it down. Now here that would be unthinkable. Just unthinkable. It was true. It was true when it was written. It, it remains true about what happened then. Uh, uh, you know, we would say we don't destroy history, and we would say we don't. We don't want. We don't want to empower courts or any government entities to start telling us what sort of truthful, accurate, uh, whatever f material d duly published and not not libelous, et cetera, what sort of material may continue to be made public? And in Europe, uh, caring as they do, more than we do about what they view as privacy, and less than we do about freedom of expression, the, the, the line that they have drawn, and really drawn in the sand, is continued relevance. And you can see how loose uh, and amorphous that line can be. Uh, there may be no continued relevance about the, you know, the guy who drove his car and was written up all those years ago, uh, depending how you view it. Uh, but the European approach now is that uh, Google and the other carriers, as it were, can't continue to carry material of that sort. Uh, and we, and in, in this case, Canada with us, Canada is usually with Europe on these things, but, but we in Canada have held firm. But in the New York legislature, just weeks ago, a right to be forgotten was introduced wow. as, as proposed legislation and supported by one legislator on the ground, you know, why should someone have to suffer years after the fact uh, for, uh, you know, some em embarrassing event? The, the fact, as you pointed out, that, that included in, uh, in Europe amongst the things that can't be said, uh, via Google at least, are trials. I mean, not just slippery newspaper articles, which may or may not have been fair or the like, but the result of trials uh, and, and the testimony at trials uh, and findings of judges at trials. Uh, and they would say, and the supporters, just to be clear with you, 
of this ha have, have said, we don't do this to public people, uh, hardly ever in any event. Uh, we don't do it if it has some sort of claim to continuing relevance. We just think a time comes when all should be uh, unspoken uh, in, the, in the greater public interest uh, of allowing life to go on without constantly being plagued by an act or an action of 15, 20 years ago. And, and again, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting subject, an interesting topic, but it is profoundly un-American uh, and violative of the First Amendment. To, to, to have a law which requires that. And that law is now the law throughout the European Union. It is profoundly contrary to the American tradition. And you give lots of other dramatic examples of the European tradition, which if America, as you say, quoting James Whitman, is focused on the protection of liberty, Europe protects dignity. And you give examples of Finland, which, Ruder, which Reporters Without Borders says, Border says is the most protective in the world is protecting speech, which uh, dealt with a, well, you tell the story about the book written by the prime minister's lover, and the prime minister sues on the grounds that it violates his privacy and wins, and you said, imagine that happening in the age of Monica yeah. Lewinsky. Yeah, remember, I, I mean, in, in, in the Finnish case, the prime minister sued, and the government of Finland, the state, brings an action against the former girlfriend and goes to court and says, you can't say that because it intrudes upon the privacy of the then sitting prime minister. Uh, and the court acted as if it was sort of splitting the baby, saying, well, the book can go on, but take out everything about sex <laughs> and, <laughs> and take out everything about the children of the prime minister and how they reacted to the girlfriend. Um, so you've got a blog item after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, so, yeah, uh, uh, again, I, it's important, I think, to, to be clear, that at least as I view it, these are not absurd results. They're not crazy and they're not intended to suppress uh, speech that matters, et cetera. But they all presuppose a willingness on the part of the public to have a society uh, in which constant decisions are being made about what may be said and what not, and being made by some entity of the government uh, as it determines what is good for the people or bad for the people to hear. Uh, and, you know, while there are always exceptions, but that, that is not the direction in which we have gone. And, and so, uh, as regards a right to be forgotten, I, I think the Supreme Court would sort of ache to get a case like that so, so they could come out with some nice unanimous decision uh, 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 with flags flying, uh, uh, defending freedom of speech. Are you concerned, I think you are from this book, uh, about the Europeanization of the American free speech tradition? And from college campuses to efforts to suppress hate speech online, we're seeing calls in America yeah. to impose the dignitary norms that Europe takes for granted. Why is that dangerous? And are you concerned that uh, the tradition you're defending might be under siege? Well, I am concerned in particular about what we see on college campuses. And you know, while one can argue about how prevalent these problems are, uh, they're very real. Uh, remember first that the First Amendment only applies to the government, right? So it only applies to actions of the state, not private entities. So a state college, University of Virginia, uh, for example, University of Pennsylvania, is bound by the First Amendment. It is the government and it is treated as the government. Uh, but, uh, you know, Princeton or Lehigh or uh, other u universities, colleges that are private are not bound by the First Amendment. They can have their own policies as they choose. Now, most colleges have decided to follow the First Amendment norms, most private ones, but they don't have to. 
So what do we see on campus? As we do see, you know, a, a, a significant amount of restraint on uh, speakers who are chosen, controversial speakers, usually of the right politically, uh, but others as well. I mean, the uh, mayor of Jerusalem shouted down when he tried, he was invited to speak at San Francisco State, uh, shouted down by people critical of Israel. Uh, we see example after example on private and public campuses. Uh, uh, Ray Brown, the former police commissioner of New York, shouted down at, uh, at Brown. Uh, we see people invited and then disinvited to the humiliation of the schools. Condoleezza Rice, uh, for one. Uh, uh, and it, it has you know, seemed to me that, that this suggests a, a lack of understanding on the part of students who participate in those sorts of activities about the nature of free expression in a free society, at least in our society, uh, an unwillingness to allow speech to be heard, uh, which they think is deeply, profoundly, uh, pick your word, uh, uh, wrong, wrong-headed, would lead people in the wrong direction. I mean, sometimes it reaches a level of absurdity that one can only laugh at Emory College in Georgia. Uh, 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 students protested, some people had put in chalk on the ground supporting Trump for president. And students protested that their psyche was hurt <laughs> by seeing it and it made them feel bad. Uh, 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 and there, there, were, there was a whole proceeding about it. I mean, I mean they, as if one had to take this sort of thing seriously. But, but more commonly, uh, and, and more dangerously, I think. You know, we see just a lot of examples of people on campuses around the country who were, in one way or another, not permitted to speak because of their views, uh, and very often not permitted to speak even though people on what I'll call the other side had been permitted to speak. And while it's certainly true that sometimes the people invited have been invited for the very purpose of creating a stir and maybe even hopefully creating a First Amendment explosion of one sort or another, the underlying reality, in my view, is the same. And that is we really have a problem there. And part of the problem is I just don't think uh, students of a certain age have been taught about the Constitution in general, or the First Amendment specifically, before they get to college. There aren't classes in civics anymore. Uh, they, they aren't, uh, uh, they don't teach. Uh, an awful lot of, of I, I know this sounds circa 1950, but, but on, on this, uh, the, the older situation was better than the current, current one because on this issue, however much it stuck with students or not, and who knows, at least they were taught and they were taught when they were young that there was such a thing as an American Constitution and an American Bill of Rights uh, and uh, an American right to speak and have your say. That's why to me it's so cheering to be here at this institution and, and see young kids walking around looking at, at displays from our Constitution uh, and at interactive ways of learning about what our Constitution has meant and come to mean through the years. Thank you for that, Floyd, and it is meaningful. That is why all of our educational efforts are so important, and that's why it's so important for all of you and for C-SPAN viewers to learn about the First Amendment traditions that Floyd is describing, to debate them and make up your own mind, and of course the best place to start is on the thrilling 
interactive constitution <laughs> that you can find in the App Store. And the point of it is that you hear the leading liberal and conservative scholars in America debating what they agree and disagree about the First Amendment tradition. In practice, Floyd, I, I know you're asked to give advice to college presidents. Let's say you have one who agrees with you and Justice Brandeis in the Supreme Court that speech can only be banned if it's intended to and yeah. likely to cause imminent violence, but doesn't know what to do when there's I know. the threat of a riot at Berkeley with Ann Coulter, for example, or Charles Murray. What, and tell us about the heckler's veto and yeah. why we shouldn't, and what in practice a college president should have done in the Ann Coulter case. In my view, it should never be an excuse, never, that a person who is invited to speak by whatever means the university has or when they allow students to invite, when the students invite, it should never be the case that security problems should bar the speaker. I mean, there, there is a way, if you care enough, to protect speakers. And it's just unacceptable to say that, that you can ban or limit or even apologize, but not have certain speakers because of their, of their message. Now, there are hard situations, uh, and, and I'm very sympathetic with the university administrators and very glad that I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, thinking through you know, how my students in good faith you know, who don't throw things or anything, but are just hurt, you know, wounded, uh, 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 come to feel oppressed as a result of, of certain speakers who are incendiary in what they have to say, who don't call for violence. I'm not talking about incitement to violence. But you know, there's a problem when we have racist speakers. It's a real problem. And, and it isn't answered by simply saying the First Amendment. Uh, 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 but the way to deal with it is not to ban the speech. But the First Amendment message is to answer the speech or protest the speech or take any one of a lot of steps that are, that are available to make clear how much one detests the views expressed. And some heckling is allowed too. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to all be polite all the time. But the, but, but the one fundamental rule, it seems to me, the, the rule that, that cannot be, that cannot have exceptions to it, is that you can't shut up speakers. You, you, you can't shut them up either physically this happened, happened at Middlebury College not so long ago, and you can't shut them up by screaming uh, in, a, in a way that the speaker simply cannot be heard. I mean, that, that is a violation of all that the First Amendment cares about. The First Amendment allows all the protesting, but it doesn't allow the suppression of speech, and that's true even with, and maybe especially, with controversial speakers. I mean, if all you have are speakers who are moderate and middle of the road, sort of like me. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, no, no, no one's gonna, no one's gonna shut up people who have those views. The people that tend to get shut up and shut down say outrageous things, or at least very controversial things in very controversial ways. They're the people who need the First Amendment. Uh, and all of us need it to protect them and therefore all of us. Uh, beautifully said, as you can see from my neat piles, our phenomenally engaged audience has a series of questions and many of them are on uh, some s similar topics. So I'm gonna jump right in. The first asks, uh, the first set of questions asks, should clergy be allowed to support candidates or political positions from the pulpit? And does Trump's recent executive order to allow faith-based organizations to support political candidates violate the Establishment Clause? Yeah. I mean, uh, he murmured, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I was afraid somebody would ask It's that, a very uh, smart audience. Because I'm really torn uh, about that. I really am. Uh, I mean, I, I really, st uh, let me say the easy part first. Uh, the easy part is that 
the Trump executive order really doesn't change very much at, at all. It's very narrow. People on the right who really wanted something big time from him will be more disappointed than, than I don't want to say, uh, this is not a left-right thing so much, but people who oppose that. That said, uh, I'm very reluctant to have rules or regulations which limit what can be said from the pulpit, uh, uh, which, which limit what uh, religious leaders or spokesmen can say. Um, uh, the way these laws work is that the risk here is not anybody going to jail, the risk is losing your tax exemption. Uh, re religious organizations are not supposed to engage in politics. Um, and if they engage enough in politics, they'll be treated like people in politics and not like people of religion. Uh, and, and so the, the, there, there's on, on the one hand a danger here in my view, and it's a First Amendment free speech danger of limiting what uh, priests and rabbis and imams and everyone else can say uh, about politics as well as other things. Uh, and not to say that is to ask for a lot of trouble, both definitionally and otherwise. I mean, is a, are we really gonna say a priest runs some risk of losing a tax exemption by opposing abortion publicly in his church, et cetera, uh, even though the abortion issue is central to an ongoing presidential race? Uh, I, I don't like to get there. I have to acknowledge, though, this is the lawyer on the one hand. The other hand, but, but this is a hard issue. On the other hand, you know, our other clauses of the First Amendment uh, deal with freedom of religion. Indeed, it starts with religion before it gets to press or speech. Um, and and it, it, it prevents uh, a, a government action uh, which at its most obvious results in a state church, but also uh, involves you know, the government with religion or against religion. Uh, and, and there are all sorts of things that, that our courts have said that religious organizations uh, can't get without being treated like everyone else. Uh, I mean, there are all cases about can, uh, can a public school be used by a religious organization uh, to engage in uh, uh, a gym, uh, basketball games? Uh, are we subsidizing a religion by saying you can use public school property? These are all hard cases. Uh, and here, too, th this, is, this is a very hard and difficult case. But my starting point is, is my reluctance to get into limitations uh, on, on speech, even by using the uh, limitations imposed uh, by the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, subtly and uh, sophisticatedly uh, answered. Uh, we have a series of questions about fake news. The first, is fake news protected speech? The second, why should a lie on the internet that leads to violence be protected? For example, fake news that Hillary Clinton was running a, a sex ring out of a Washington, D.C. pizza shop led to a violent assault on the pizza shop. People could have been killed. And then rela a related question, although not the same one, are President Trump's comments about fake news and libel laws a threat to the First Amendment? I was trying to think of a no, yes, no, <laughs> a way, way, or yes, no, yes. Uh, 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 let, let me scout around uh, in those three uh, areas. Uh, let me deal with the third one first, because that's one I think about a lot, the impact of President Trump. Uh, we've never had a situation before in which a president engaged in a sort of daily denigration of the press. We've never had a situation where, as a matter of what I consider to be policy, an American administration uh, 
tried so hard to persuade the American public that the, the bulk of the American press was not to be trusted or, or believed uh, or, or treated with the general respect that has been the case uh, uh, historically. And that said, it is true that we've had presidents who have done things to the press, which certainly President Trump hasn't done in his 100 plus days, and which he may never do. I mean, you know, it was John Adams, not Donald Trump, who got the Sedition Act of 1798 through, as a result of which a lot of journalists were jailed. It was Teddy Roosevelt who tried to jail Joseph Pulitzer because of things Pulitzer had written about the Panama Canal. Uh, now they had eight years, or, or Adams had four, but, but uh, 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 you know, so it, it is too early to pass judgment on what President Trump does about the press. His language is dangerous language, I think, what he has urged about the press uh, ranges from, uh, from awful to horrible. Uh, he has said, uh, I want to loosen the libel laws. So, this is almost a quote, people like me, Trump, can bring lawsuits. He's got a lot of money. Uh, uh, it is not a genuine threat, even though it is meant as a general threat, because we don't have any federal libel law. There is no United States libel law. There's nothing to amend. There's nothing for Congress to do. We have 50 states, they have libel law. The United States doesn't have a libel law, so it's not the most credible threat. Beyond that, and more important for purposes of our meeting here today, the First Amendment is really what prevents Donald Trump and other powerful and wealthy people from winning libel suits they might otherwise have won. <coughs> That's because the Supreme Court in 1964, in the great New York Times against Sullivan case, said that when a public official, let alone a president, a public official uh, brings a libel suit about his conduct. He can't win unless the material published was not only false, but known to be false or suspected to be false by the speaker. And that's really hard to prove. For one thing, it's rarely true. Beyond that, even when it's true, it's really hard to prove that the state of mind, and that's what we're talking about, that the state of mind of the journalist was, was to lie. Now, the example that I keep thinking about, about that body of law is, suppose President Obama were to sue President Trump for President Trump's, you pick your own word, but uh, inaccurate statement, uh, false statement, President Obama had wiretapped him, which would be a crime. I mean, he has accused President Obama of a crime. If President Obama sued him for libel, he would have to meet these tests. And President Trump, who ought to be grateful for the tests which keep people from bringing libel cases, <laughs> uh, President Trump could avail himself, as he has in a few cases in which he has been uh, sued of these uh, protections. So what would Obama have to prove? He'd have to prove he made a, uh, Trump made a statement, yes, about him, yes, that it was false, yes, that it was defamatory, you know, very bad about, about his reputation, yes, and, and this is the part President Trump doesn't like about the First Amendment law about libel, and that he knew it wasn't true or that he had a high degree of awareness that it was probably false. That's where that case would be. That would be the only issue, I believe, 
uh, in the case, the only serious issue in any of that. Um, and that's because of the First Amendment. And again, in that area as well, we have more protection for speech and sometimes, therefore, false speech than is true anywhere in the world. I mean, we protect it across the board, uh, not, not always. I mean, people still bring libel cases, and they win sometimes. But when you're talking about a public official, it's really hard to win that libel case. And that's what the president really objects to, and that's what the First Amendment really protects. That was a superb answer to the third question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first one is important. Just yeah. is what is the legal status of fake news? So one of our audience right, members right, asks, right. could Macron be president of the US? And Article 2, I just wanted to make sure I got it right, says that the president has to be both a natural born citizen and 35 years of age. So Macron is 39, I think, but he's not a natural born citizen. So let's imagine I publish, I knowingly publish a blog post on Constitution Daily saying, Macron could be president, knowing that he can't because he's not a natural born citizen. Is that actionable, legally protected? What's the legal status of this false well, post? It's not actionable first because there's no one around who can sue. Uh, I mean, you do have to show that it, it hurt you to bring any lawsuit. Uh, but but on, the, on the First Amendment side or on the broader issue of fake news, uh, uh, um, there's no difference in the law the, between fake news and untrue news. I mean, we do provide a remedy for all that I've just said. One can bring libel suits about things that are said that are false uh, uh, about the person uh, about whom they are said. Uh, and if it's a public person who's at issue, it has to meet this greater burden. But that, that can occur. There, there's nothing else added on. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing additional if you call it, or if it is, fake news. Now, is there something society can do about fake news other than the, uh, the potential use of the libel law? Um, the only thing, I think, is uh, private and not public, which is to say, not an act of Congress, uh, but private. Google, Facebook can take steps. Facebook is trying to take some steps so it doesn't wind up carrying fake news. Fake news I'm defining as meaning as you know, deliberately concocted false uh, information about things that did not happen, not mistakes not bad journalism, but, 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 but a whole construct, which is what, what we mean by fake news, a story such as the question referred to, that what Hillary Clinton was working at a pizza shop or, or had, you know, that, that children are being abused in the pizza stop, shop somehow because of Hillary Clinton. Uh, yes, could she have sued? Yes, I mean, it, yes, she could bring a lawsuit against uh, whoever, whoever released that. It's false, it's known to be false, and the like. But, you know, it's, it's not a remedy that, that, that's gonna accomplish anything. Uh, the only way to deal with fake news <laughs> is twofold. One is for us to reject it out of hand when we see it and condemn the people that put it out. And the other is for the entities that control the, the means of, of communication, the, the Facebooks of the world, to take steps not to carry, to, to exercise a sort of editorial judgment, which is in general what Facebook and other entities have tried not to do for various legal reasons and otherwise. I mean, the, Facebook doesn't say, we present the best and the brightest. Fa face, face, <laughs> I mean, Facebook says, you know, if you say it, you can see it. Uh, but but the, the reality is, again and again, these enormous institutions, you talk about Citizens United, you talk about the power of Facebook to impact public opinion, 
I mean, it's the place most people in the United States get all their news from now, is Facebook. Uh, and so Facebook has been put in a position where the public, their public, has demanded that they do something about racist speech, something the government can't do, because we protect it. The government can't get into it, but Facebook can, and Facebook shouldn't show people killing themselves, and Facebook shouldn't show suicides of children, uh, and again and again, and it will continue, and it should continue in my view, but again and again, <coughs> Facebook and its competitors are going to find themselves in a position where they simply have to engage to a greater degree than they do now with what one would call editorial judgment. And there are some good legal reasons why they'd rather not, but, but it is simply something they must do and will do. This is the last question then, and it goes back to our first. After the French election, the media voluntarily chose not to publish the information because it thought it would distort public discourse. And you just said Facebook should restrict hate speech or fake news to promote public yeah. reason. If Madison believed that the American Republic would fail unless public reason prevailed, do you believe that the platforms have an obligation to monitor the content of speech in order to promote public reason? And are you optimistic or pessimistic that public reason can survive in the age of the internet, or are we all doomed? This is not a time in American history in which I think anyone can be too optimistic about public reason <laughs> triumphing. Um, but, you know, but we have to go on and we have to hope that it does on, on everything, uh, not just political, political, social, cultural matters. Um, uh, <coughs> I, think, I think Madison would be surprised and more than a little depressed at, at some matters that are front and center in the American psyche today where people get their news, how little people know about the news, uh, the, even the most fundamental things about the American government itself, uh, its nature, uh, uh, how many branches of government we have. Uh, 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 you know, I, I think we did have, in general, a more educated public at an earlier time in our history. And yet, we now have the tools for the first time in the history of the world at low cost and easy uh, uh, mechanisms to, to hear about everything, learn about everything in the world. I mean, there, there's never been a time in which there was more information, more available at, with less difficulty and more speech available to all of us in our own ways online than was ever the case ever before in the, in the history uh, of the world. But the, the question is what we make of that. Uh, and what we make of that is something that uh, we'll, we'll have to wait a few more years to pass judgment on. Good. When you said Madison would be depressed, I felt sad too, but when you give us this possibility of learning and of educating ourselves on the internet, I am given hope. There are so many other great questions. What I want to do is answer them on this great feature we have called Ask Jeff. And now it's going to be Ask Jeff and Floyd for the, rema for the uh, remaining Citizens United questions. But if you sign up as a member of the Constitution Center, how many of you are members? Beautiful. Wow. Okay, everyone who's not, go sign up. C-SPAN people, go to the website, become members of the Constitution Center at any level, $5, $10. The point is to get this content. You'll get a weekly e-newsletter, Constitutional Weekly, where we answer the constitutional questions of the week, as well as disseminating these educational materials, these podcasts, and these videos that are so important for all of us to learn about and to educate ourselves so that the public reason that Floyd has defended so eloquently and the American Republic itself will survive.
for his services to the First Amendment and for this spectacular book. Please join me in thanking Floyd Abrams. Thank you.